Blake, by his own admission, gave away hundreds of British agents. Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kisson. And this is a show for you if you want honest conversations with fascinating people. Our brilliant guest today is a journalist for the Financial Times and now the author of The Happy Traitor. Simon Cooper, welcome to Trigonometry. It's an honor to be here. This is the very first interview I've done in English about this book. And I did not know that you two existed apart from Kilconomics, the festival where I always meet you. So it's great to see that you are real people. Thank you very much. Uh, there are a lot of people who think we're controlled opposition and avatars created by the government. So <laughs> yeah, yes. we do exist. Jewish shills and there's all <laughs> sorts of other options, uh, whatever you, the side of the political spectrum you hate us from. Uh, but let, enough about us, Simon. You've written a brilliant book. I've always enjoyed your, your commentary anyway. Uh, you, you've written about football quite a lot and about many other subjects. But The Happy Traitor is, is uh, a biography of George Blake, the double agent. Uh, before we get into that, uh, tell everybody a little bit ab about who you are, how are you, where you are, what was your interest in writing this book, uh, and, and so on. Well, I spent most of my life writing for the Financial Times. I used to write sports stuff, and I write political and cultural stuff about how the world is coming to an end, as we all know. And I am quite an international person, like you, Constantine, and I grew up mostly in the Netherlands. By chance, my dad had a job there. And so about 20 years ago, I read an article in, in Holland about this KGB agent who was British Dutch in origin. He'd grown up in Holland, uh, British, Egyptian Jewish father, and he had ended up, George Blake, a KGB agent, jailed in Britain, escaped to Moscow. And I thought, what an amazing story. That was the first I heard. I must interview this guy one day because I grew up about 20 miles away from him in the Netherlands, uh, also Jewish, also British, also speaking Dutch as he did. So ego egoistically, I saw a lot of similarities between me and Blake. And then in 2012, I was going to speak at a conference in Moscow. And I have a Dutch friend in Moscow who knows Blake, who knew Blake. And I said, would you set me up with Blake? And, you know, the story goes on, I could bang on about that. But in the end, I'm sitting in Blake's stature listening to this story. I mean, I was, the deal was, it was complicated to arrange it with Blake. As you can imagine, KGB double agents are not always keen to go on the record, etc. So Blake actually phoned me to interview me first. And I was in this Moscow cemetery. I was looking at the graves of Chekhov and Khrushchev. I can't remember the name of the cemetery. It's a well-known one in Moscow. And Blake calls me and he speaks in this very old-fashioned sort of pre-war Dutch accent. We have a nice chat. And his issue, which he doesn't dare express, is he doesn't want me to ask him about Putin because he's very afraid of Putin. He, hate, he hates Putin. He thinks Putin is anti-democratic, etc. But he relies for Putin on his pension and his dacha. And so I say, look, you know, Mr. Blake, I'm not going to, I won't ask you about Putin. I want to ask you about your life, etc. So he says, come on over. And uh, we had a lovely time together. Actually, I have to admit, I really liked the guy, which is something I had to wean myself off in the later writing. And I walked out of his dacha after four hours thinking, I was only going to write an interview for a Dutch newspaper. He only wanted me to write about it in Dutch. And I walked out thinking that was the most interesting interview I've ever done in my journalistic career. Wow. But my kids were quite small at the time, so I never had a free moment to myself. So only a couple of years later did I think, actually, you know, I'm no longer in the playground every hour of the weekend. I could think about turning this interview into a book. So then I began to research his life. And is the book is a happy traitor. Uh, we've both read it. It is absolutely brilliant. He did lead a fascinating life. Why do you think it was that for someone who was actually a very, very mild-mannered man, he then went and had this career where he became a double agent, risking his life and also ending many others. I mean, he says himself that to be a spy, you have to kind of like the game, the secrecy, the adventure. And, you know, he was always into kind of dressing up and acting. I mean, even as a, ch as a child with his sisters, he'd act the pastor. His ambition was to be a Covenant pastor. pastor. He would act Hitler. Uh, who was, of course, a big figure on the world stage in his childhood. And he liked the thrill. So when he's 
17, 18, World War II breaks out and he's in the Netherlands having spent a few years with family in Cairo. And he joins the Dutch resistance as a teenage courier. And he has very exciting times, but he thinks, I want the big stage. And also I want to join my mummy in England. She'd fled to England when the war broke out. He was very much a mummy's boy. And so he escapes through Belgium and France and Franco Spain. Amazing journey in 1942-43, underground through occupied Europe to Britain, where he does indeed join the British Secret Services. So he'd always had this kind of yen for adventure, for the double life, uh, behind this mild-mannered facade. But he was also an idealist. I mean, he starts off with this very pious Calvinist, and he then becomes a very pious communist. Mm. Well, actually, this was what I was going to ask you about, because my impression, and correct me if I'm wrong from, from the book, is that by the time he joins the British Secret Service, he's already a, a committed communist. Is that correct? That's not what I believe. Some people have suggested that. I don't think so. I think in his youth, into his 20s, he's a Calvinist. In the war, he still thinks, well, after the war, I'm going to become a pastor. And he's very anti-Nazi, anti-Hitler. He's a half-Jewish Briton living in the occupied Netherlands. So he he very courageously takes the side of the resistance, which very few Dutch people did. And he gets to London and his focus is on winning the war. He's not really a British patriot, never pretended to be, but he, you know, he's part of the Dutch effort to win the war. And it's only later when the when MI6, SIS as it then was, the Secret Intelligence Service, sent him to South Korea as a spy. The, the Korean War breaks out in 1950. He is held captive by the North Koreans for two years with other British and French prisoners. And in that time, the almost the only reading matter they are sent is Marx and Lenin in Russian. So mm. Marx in Russian translation. Sounds like a modern university <laughs> campus, Simon. <laughs> um, it is like distance learning, it's true. <laughs> Yeah, so you got the good shit in the original language. <laughs> yeah. Well, he he um, he could have read Marx in German as well. I mean, Blake was very much a languages man, but he'd learned Russian in a year in Cambridge. He, he wasn't there with Kim Philby at all. He was there in 1947-48, but he goes to Cambridge, he learns Russian, he loves the language. Within months, he can read Anna Karenina in the original. And so well, when he's in captivity, I mean, they had nothing to do for two years, a group of highly intelligent men. And at one point, the Soviet embassy sent them this package of books. They're very excited, but there's only one book in English, Treasure Island by Stevenson. So they think, okay, well, who gets to read Treasure Island first? This is going to be the biggest thrill of, of our lives here. So they draw lots. And so they read Stevenson in turn, and they just keep rereading it. And in the end, the copy is destroyed. And there are two books in Russian, Marx and Lenin. And so Blake and the former British consul in Korea, who's an old British conservative, read Marx in Russian, discuss it. And the consul says to Blake, you know, I'm an anti-communist, but I believe that Marx is correct, that communism is the future. It will replace the British Empire. And um, I, I'm sorry to say that I think communism is going to win. And Blake was very persuaded by this. And, but we talk about, so, I mean, his ideological indoctrination, you might say, at this particular point. But the seeds of his belief in communism were sowed much earlier in his time in Egypt with the disparity between rich and poor that he observed. There were many forces pushing him. I mean, when his father dies, they get a letter from the father's sister in Cairo. And she says, well, um, my brother, you probably didn't know it, he was Jewish. That was a huge shock to Blake's family. Never knew the father was Jewish. Anyway, uh, you must be quite poor now that your husband has died, she writes to Blake's mother, so come and live in our mansion in Cairo. And I've seen pictures, it's an amazing mansion, it's now the Algerian embassy. So Blake lives in this fantastic opulence in uh, Cairo, which was then a kind of European-run city. And he lives with this Jewish family, they speak French, and they are the richest people in the world. And around them, the average age of death for Egyptians is about 30. I mean, it's, the circumstances are terrible. The family has a kind of textile uh, mill on the Nile uh, where the workers' children are treated terribly. And so that, I think, was definitely something that worked on Blake, that he thought, well, you know, the world is unjust. But he had grown up believing that, co that communism was the enemy of God, and so these influences work on him a bit. The British Secret Service, 
fatally give him this book which they've written. A guy called Carew Hunt had written a book for the British spy service called Theory and Practice of Communism. The idea being, you know, communism is the new enemy post-war, so we have to understand communism, what it is. And so Carew Hunt very kind of honestly and fairly tries to describe communism, meaning, you know, this is what we're up against, chaps. But Blake reads his book and thinks, wow, that's very convincing. Communism sounds just the thing. And so all these influences work on him. He falls in love with Russia and with Russian, again, taught by a very uh, anti-communist Russian-British exile at Cambridge. And so when he starts to read Marx in 1950, all these influences have come together. He's lost his faith in God. He also believes very strongly in uh, determinism. Everything we do in life is determined. Uh, God shapes all our actions. And the communists, of course, have a version of that, which is history is determined. Uh, There's nothing really the individual can do about it. So he's very much kind of equipped for communism when he meets it head on in Korea. And once then that happens and he goes back to the UK, where was the moment where he actually started to defect and start to work for the KGB and the Soviets? That happens in in North Korea. I mean, it's not quite clear exactly who chats up who. He says at one point he slips a note to the North Korean camp commander who the prisoners called Fatso. So he gives this note to Fatso in Russian. Disgusting bigotry and fat shaming. I can't believe in 1950 they didn't... Oh, unbelievable. Anyway, sorry, Sam, carry on. I think the prisoners were quite thin at that point. <laughs> <laughs> Very privileged. <Yeah. laughs> Um, they, they were privileged men, but not at a very privileged moment of their lives. And yeah. so at that point, a KGB agent from Vladivostok shows up, a guy called um, Nikolai no- Laenko. Laenko. And Laenka uh, interrogates all the prisoners. And he and Blake kind of recognize kindred spirits in each other. And so Laenka says to Blake, you know, you could be a KGB spy. And so... In 1953, Stalin dies. Immediately, there's a big thaw, and the prisoners are happily released. They go straight to China, where they all have a big bath together, and they sing nursery rhymes. They're elated. They're given new suits. And in spring 1953, Blake arrives back in Britain. He and the other British prisoners are given a hero's welcome at RAF Abingdon Airport. And he goes back to the SIS and says, hi, guys, here I am. And they say, wow, you're the hero of North Korea. You survived communist captivity. And weirdly, I mean, just two years before, Guy Burgess and Donald McLean had defected to Moscow. So, and Kim Philby was under suspicion. So MI6 knew, you know, there are some some bad eggs around him. And yet it doesn't seem to have occurred to anyone to check out Blake to see whether he might have been turned in North Korean captivity. They just say, welcome back, George, you know, come straight in. That's really interesting, isn't it, Simon? Because as you'll know, you know, and and I obviously know having grown up in Russia and the Soviet Union, that was not the way that returning heroes were treated in the Soviet Union. If, If you came back from abroad having been held in captivity, you'd go straight into a gulag and be interrogated and they'd make very sure that you weren't an enemy spy. But that didn't happen. And by this point, he's already been turned. So he goes back into MI6. And at this point, he starts being a double agent. Is that right? He starts being a double agent. So he walks around with this camera strapped between his legs every day at work, a little Minox camera. And at lunch, all the other spies go to their clubs on St. James's and, you know, go out for big lunches, as posh people did in the 50s. And he um, photographs all the documents. And then he meets his uh, KGB handlers on, you know, the top flights of buses in the London fog, on corners in Belsize Park, deserted Surrey railway stations. And he hands them all these documents. And they really like it. And he tells them that the uh, the ally, the Western allies, US, UK, have built a spy tunnel under Berlin to listen to Soviet telephone calls. So he blows the Berlin spy tunnel even before it goes into operation, which is the kind of main Western listening device of the 50s. And so, yeah, he's giving the Soviets amazing stuff and he is never suspected. Because in many ways, he was actually, I mean, take aside the fact that, you know, he sent hundreds of people probably to their deaths. In many ways, he was a perfect employee, wasn't he? Yeah, I mean, he was uh, he was a very smart guy. And John le Carre, who was obsessed by him, who also kindly uh, offered a quote for the book, 
because he Le Carre read the manuscripts before he died. Le Carre says, look, if you're a double agent, you want to make a very good impression on your own service so that, you know, you get promoted, you get good jobs, uh, nobody gives you a hard time. So Blake worked very well in a, in a way for Britain and he was he was good kind of spying material because he wasn't easily blackmailable. He didn't drink, he didn't have affairs. He had a very kind of dull family life. He wasn't gay either. That was another one. He wasn't gay, although, you know, the British upper class was was more flexible on that, of course, than later generations say. So every, Burgess continued, Burgess and Blunt continued to be gay into adulthood because the, the, the system in the British upper class was you, you sort of more or less had to be gay until you finished university. And then you were supposed <laughs> to marry and go straight. And that was considered entirely um, non-blackmailable. I mean, yeah. you couldn't really say, oh, this chap had homosexual affairs at Cambridge because, of course. <laughs> that was a requirement. No, not it was a requirement for entry into the establishment. And yeah. Burgess and Blunt uh, continued to be gay after university, which was seen as eccentric, but not as particularly reprehensible, I think. Oh, God, I missed the good old days. <laughs> he went to boarding school. I did. Uh, uh, but Simon, so he, he he's not easily blackmailable. He's the model employee. Uh, and just... I mean, we're talking about it very jovially, of course, but I, I think we should also do do justice to what you might describe, I think, quite accurately this, as this man's terrible crimes. Can you sum up for us the scale of the damage he did to British and Western uh, efforts to defeat the Soviet Union and also, you know, the, the lives of the many agents that, that were taken as a result of his betrayal? Well, let's start with the agents. I mean, when the Brits finally... Um, unmasked him in 1961. They do this survey of their uh, foreign spying stations, mostly in Eastern Europe. And they reckon that Blake, by his own admission, gave away hundreds of British agents. So if you were, let's say, a telephone operator in Moscow, passing information on to Britain, Blake had given the Soviets your name, or yeah. in East Berlin. If you were a businessman um, from, let's say, Britain, who often visited the uh, Eastern Europe, then Blake had given them your name. So he betrayed probably 500 plus of these people to the Eastern powers. Now, he says the KGB assured me these people wouldn't be killed. Which... <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. I think the KGB did promise him that because, of course, they didn't care what they told him. And so SIS reckons about 40 of these people were killed. I mean, right. luckily, he did this after Stalin's death. And as you know, the USSR and the Eastern countries generally were much less bloodthirsty after 53. Yeah. And so most of these people were given long jail sentences, etc. But about 40 of them are, are reckoned to have been killed. Do you watch problematic content online? Of course they do. They watch trigonometry. <laughs> Many ISPs log your internet activity and sell that data on to other big tech companies or other advertising companies. I know, that is why I use ExpressVPN to hide my browsing activities. I bet you do. ExpressVPN is a simple app which you can have on both your computer and your smartphone, which hides your traffic into one channel and direct it through a VPN server, which means your ISP can't see anything that you're doing. Look, the question I want to ask no. is... Will it slow down the videos that I watch? Definitely not. That is one of the reasons it's been rated as the number one VPN app by CNET and Wired. I don't read those publications because I'm not a nerd. Stop handing over your personal data to ISPs and big tech companies, which are just going to use it and sell it on. Visit expressvpn.com slash trigger. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash trigger. I love it when you spell things out. But it gets even better than that. ExpressVPN are offering Trigonometry fans three extra months free. Go to expressvpn.com slash trigger to learn more. But look, let's put the counterpoint to this. This is a time of war, effectively. Now, if that had been a British person being a double agent against the Soviets, we'd all lord him to the skies as a hero. Isn't George Blake a hero to the Soviets? He is. A, he was a hero to the Soviets. Yeah, he got the order of Lenin from Putin. And 
Blake's very job for some of the time was trying to turn Russians and East Germans to get them to spy for Britain. So his job was to create double agents. So so is creating double agents there, right and being a double agent here, wrong? I mean, clearly communism was a an evil creed. I I, I do condemn Blake. I, I, I'm not trying to defend him. I mean, he was in a very low business of spying. And as Le Carre says, you know, horrible things were done on both sides, but that doesn't that doesn't negate the horrible things that Blake did and the the many lives that he destroyed. Did you ever challenge him on that, Simon? It sounds like you did talk about it. Did you ever put it to him that that dozens of people at least have died and, and hundreds of people's lives, or maybe even thousands if you include their family members, would have been ruined by his actions? Did he did did you talk to him about that? And did he have any uh, thoughts on that? Well, I raised it obliquely. I mean, we were sitting on the sofa together, we were getting on well, and it was a difficult... I, I, I'm not a kind of very big hard hitter on the spot. So I didn't really want to say, well, look, Mr. Blake, you killed about 40 people, what do you reckon? So I did say, you know, you betrayed a lot of agents. Um, do you regret anything? And then he talked about regrets he had vis-a-vis breaking up his family. You know, he was arrested when his, uh, two, his three sons were tiny and uh, left his wife behind. He talked about regrets of having betrayed the SIS, the British spying services to which he felt still loyal. He didn't talk about regrets about agents. And when he's been asked about that, when he was asked about that at other times, he always said none of these people were killed. And this is the way spying works. You know, uh, you were supposed to catch each other's agents. And if the man who betrayed me to the British were to walk into this room now, I'd give him a cup of tea. He's, his line was, this is just the game. And anyway, none of these guys were killed. So I think he genuinely came to believe that he lived in denial because he was actually quite a peaceful bloke. He, he didn't like violence, didn't like killing people. He thought all that was ugly. And so he coped with what he had done by denying it even to himself. Because in many ways, he was a picture of the perfect English gentleman, wasn't he? The way he conducted himself, the way he was, the way, who, you know, also he was very, very moral. So it's quite incongruous, the fact that the way he presents himself and this, at the same time being incredibly duplicitous. I wouldn't say he's the... Per- I would say he was the perfect gentleman, but not the perfect English gentleman. And at SIS, they always thought he's not really one of us. I mean, he wasn't posh. He was a foreigner. He was half Jewish. He hadn't been to boarding school. And so he was definitely kind of looked down on and sneered at in that way. Uh, I think that... Uh, if you think about perfect English gentlemen, you're thinking more of people like Philby and Burgess, also complete with their eccentricities, whereas Blake was a much more um, straight guy in the way he presented himself. And so not being a perfect British gentleman was one of the issues at work in the in the workplace. Mm. And do you think that contributed in any way to to what then happened, or was it purely an ideological thing with him? He just thought that communism and Marxism and Leninism were the way to go. He just believed in communism. I mean, a lot of people, especially in Britain, have written, well, he hated Britain. He was excluded by the establishment and therefore he hated Britain. Now, he was excluded by the establishment, but he didn't hate Britain at all. He quite liked Britain. He just never really had much to do with Britain because he only spent, I mean, the longest stretch of his life he spent in Britain was the five years he spent in jail before he legged it. So he didn't really spend much of his life there. He admired Britain. He was very attached to Britain's uh, wartime record. He um, he loved British uh, literature, uh, British films. So he and he thought Britain was a very upstanding place. And actually, the people who mentored him in his move to communism, unintentionally, were all conservative members of the British establishment. Elizabeth Hill, who taught him in Cambridge, gave him this love of Russia. Carew Hunt, who wrote this theory of practice of communism book. Later, his best friend in Moscow was Donald MacLean, another you know, British toff. Uh, Vivian Holt, the consul in Korea, who told him that uh, communism was the future. So he was very um, influenced by conservative Brits from the establishment. And he was rescued from jail, we might come to that, by other Brits. So, I mean, he told me at one point, look, he said, so much of my life has been given to me by kind British people. He he didn't hate Britain at all. So let's move it forward. He's doing very, very well in the service. He's doing very, very well with the KGB. Everything's going swimmingly for him. Where did it begin to go wrong? Well, the problem is always other defectors. So a couple of people from the East, uh, two Poles leading Polish intelligence officers defected, and this uh, double agent in East Germany, a kind of uh, lowly guy called uh, Horst Eitner. 
are both, uh, they all point the finger of suspicion to Blake. This guy called Golonievsky, who's, um, who's been giving the Western powers information, he defects in 1961. And later he starts to say he's the Grand Duke Alexei, the son of um, Tsar Nicholas II. So he goes a bit bonkers. But before that happens, Golonievsky um, gives them all the information that they need to see that the mole that they knew they had in the service is in fact Blake. And so Blake at this point has been, because they was already under suspicion, they didn't want to tell him, this is 1961, he's been sent to Lebanon to learn Arabic in this kind of uh, British-run school in Lebanon called Mikas. And so at one point, Nicholas Elliott, who's the um, MI6 station officer that's there, says to Blake, oh, Blake, you're wanted back in London. I think they want to give you a promotion. And so Blake, you know, suspects something, but he thinks, what can I do? You know, I don't want to blow up my family uh, by escaping to the Soviet Union now. Maybe it's nothing. So he flies back to London. He walks into um, the office at St. James's. And I said, what did you feel when you walked in? He said, I felt, and he says this in English, the game is up. Because his uh, colleague, uh, Shergold, I think Harry Shergold, says, uh, hello, Blake, um, some things to talk about. And let's walk across the park to um, our other office. And Blake realises they're going to the other office so that they can record an interrogation. And they interrogate him for a couple of days, but they know he's a spy, but they don't have any evidence that can stand up in court because it's all secret evidence. They don't want to go to court anyway, it'd be, be embarrassing. And so Blake's just denying everything. I didn't do it, I didn't and do And Simon, it. just to jump in there very briefly, when you say interrogate, uh, they're just asking him questions or are they applying a bit of the old Russian method to him? Not Russian at all. It's very uh, gentlemanly, very collegiate. He's, he's interrogated by three colleagues who he knows well, one of whom is a good friend. And they're all sitting around and it's a nice chat. And uh, in the evenings, he's allowed to go home to his mother's house in Radlett in Hertfordshire. So they do take the precaution of tailing him just in case. But every evening he leaves the interrogation and he takes the train to Radlett, where he's not allowed to tell his mother, who's his closest friend in the world, that he's being interrogated. And so on the third day, Shergold says to him, well, Blake, you know, of course you spied for them, but you couldn't really help it, could you? The Koreans tortured you, they made you do it. You didn't have a choice. And Blake said, bursts out and suddenly he says, no, nobody tortured me. Nobody forced me. I spied for the KGB of my own accord. I did it out of belief because he desperately wants people to see him as an idealist, which he is. And they can't believe it. He's given this kind of unforced confession. Given another half hour, they'd have said to him, OK, you know, George, get on a plane to Moscow. We never want to see you again. Go. Um, but they they suddenly have this this confession and then he just confesses the whole thing and he even stupidly confesses to the police, not realising that the confession he'd given to his SIS colleagues wouldn't stand up in court. He then confesses to the police. Have you ever been abroad and felt out of place because you didn't speak the language? No, because I voted Brexit. Brexit means Brexit. I know that sometimes you're abroad, you don't speak the local language, it's very awkward, like Francis talking to a woman. So you have to shout. Do you want to learn another language? I don't, for obvious reasons. But if you do, Babbel is quite simply one of the finest language learning apps in the business. Babbel offers a clear and easy to use interface. They have daily 10 to 15 minute lessons that have been proven effective across many studies showing that you can learn up to 14 languages that they offer. So it doesn't matter if you struggle with language. Maybe you find it difficult to pick up or maybe you're just English. Right now, Babbel is offering our fans six months free on a six-month subscription with Babbel using our special code, which is, of course, Trigger. That's Babbel. B-A-B-B-E-L dot co dot UK slash play. And use the promo code Trigger. Look at that spelling. He learned English on Babbel. I did. But seriously, go to babbel.co.uk forward slash play, use our code trigger and enjoy Babbel. And there's that great scene in the book where he's going to, I think, going to make a phone call, isn't he, in the park? And then there's the moment of hesitation. Could you expand upon that a little bit? What happened there? Yeah, it seems that he waits outside the telephone booth. Of course, they tail him on his lunch breaks. So on his lunch break, he goes to the telephone booth and he walks in and then he walks out again, doesn't make the call. And then he goes back in. And then he walks out, doesn't make the call. And the suspicion is that he wanted to call his KGB handler and say, look, they got me, what should I do? Uh, because the KGB had never given him advice on what to do if caught. 
the line was, well, you won't be caught anyway. <laughs> but the, and the thing that I loved about the book is that you took the personal, which is the story of Blake, but you also expanded it into the international. Like the Americans, actually, they, were, they came across really well. They were very understanding. So in, in spring 61, the Brits call the Americans and say, oh, uh, something rather embarrassing has happened. <laughs> and it's that Blake, you know, not only um, we had various spying scandals, we just had the Portland spy ring blown, Burgess McLean. But now this bloke, Blake, essentially he's given up every Western agent to the Eastern Bloc for eight years now. And the Americans, of course, not happy about this at all. However, luckily for the Brits, the Bay of Pigs has just happened. The stir-crazy, completely failed American attempt to invade Castro's Cuba using a ragtag bag of Cuban exiles, looking a lot like the storming of the capital, but in Cuba. A um, bunch of crazy right-wing nuts trying to um, subvert a government. Where have we seen that before? So the Bay of Pigs has gone completely wrong. It's a massive intelligence disaster. So the Americans are not really in a great position to lecture the Brits. The Americans do go back and say to each other, never give these idiot Brits any more information again. But they can't afford to really go in hard on the Brits at that particular moment. Macmillan, the prime minister, is hugely embarrassed. Macmillan refers to the um, so-called secret services. He thinks his um, spies are a bunch of idiots and are just there more or less to embarrass him, which is not wrong. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, so, Simon, he gets caught. He confesses even to the police, not realizing that he didn't actually need to. Uh, and then he gets sentenced to, is it 44 years? 42 years. 42. So, uh, it seems that the judge had quite, against all law rules, had called Macmillan the prime minister before sentencing <laughs> and had asked Macmillan, you know, this chap Blake, has he done much damage? How much damage has he done? Wow. And you are really not, as a judge in uh, in England, supposed to discuss cases under uh, in your court with anyone else and certainly not with the prime minister. But it appears that this is what Justice Parker did. And so he then gives Blake 42 years, which even Macmillan calls a savage sentence, the longest uh, jail sentence in modern British history, meaning that Blake, if he served it, would be in jail till 2003. Wow. Wow. And I mean, that, that caused a stir primarily as well, because he was working for MI6 and MI6, no one even knew that it existed. So, uh, you weren't allowed to publicise, talk about it, the wider population didn't know. Wasn't there, I, I loved the bit where Macmillan was almost trying, considering whether just to hush it up because it was more embarrassment than it was worth. Yeah, Macmillan's analogy says, when my gamekeeper catches a fox, he doesn't, doesn't string it up in the front room. It's <laughs> <laughs> a great line. And so, yeah, Macmillan thought all this should be secret. We should not be having these trials which are in public inevitably. And Dick White, who was head of SIS, said, no, um, you know, Blake has done these terrible things. We're going to make an example of him. Now, of course, they didn't make an example of uh, the posh spies. So Philby was under suspicion at this point, but he had been allowed to go to Beirut to work as a newspaper correspondent. And Anthony Blunt was, uh, was actually became keeper of the Queen's pictures. And John Cancross, who would later make two confessions of being a, a KGB spy, was allowed to return to Britain in old age and die happily in a village in Wiltshire. So they only made an example of Blake. They didn't make an example of the um, of the Toffs. I know it's a very Russian question of me to ask, but do you think there was ever any consideration of just him, you know, you know, I don't know if they had the same technology that we do now, but, you know, having a cup of tea or going for a walk and, you know, having a little heart attack or anything like that? There was discussion. I mean, they had this uh, weekend after Blake's confession. The interrogators say, OK, Shergold says, let's all go to my cottage in Surrey, I think, and we'll have a weekend there and we'll talk about this together. So Blake is there and Shergold's mother and Blake make pancakes in the kitchen for everyone and it's all quite jolly. But meanwhile, the MI6 people are having this conversation of can we bump him off? It would save us a lot of embarrassment. In the end, it is decided that this is not appropriate. And do you know why? Was that just not d the done thing at the time? Or did they have some particular reason to think that way? I think MI6 probably didn't want to start bumping off British citizens in Britain. 
there might have been pesky questions from the opposition benches, etc. I'm guessing that that would have been a consideration. And Britain, you know, for all its faults, Britain is a democracy and there is scrutiny of this kind of stuff. So although one would like to draw the analogy with the USSR, as you do, there, there are important differences. Yeah, well, this is why, I, just to finish this point, uh, this is why I'm curious whether how seriously you take Blake's denial of the agents that he betrayed being killed. Because if in his mind, well, look look what I've done and no one did anything to me, why would the KGB be killing off these telephone operators or whatever? Do you think he just, you know, that's why he didn't believe that the spies he betrayed had been killed? I mean, Blake had seen a lot of violence in his life. You know, he had been in the resistance he had been in post-war occupied Germany where he had to deal with a lot of former Nazis in the German Navy. He had been in Korea where he'd seen American airplanes destroying Korean villages where the half the prisoners he was with died on a death march. I mean, he knew that terrible things were done in the world. He, he was not a blue-eyed boy by that point. Mm. And the judge sentenced him. There were three years, each of four, three concurrent sentences, weren't there? Each of 14 years, if memory serves correctly. He then gets sent to Wormwood Scrubs, where he's a bit of a model prisoner, isn't he? You like this guy, don't you? I kind of did. Francis is a big fan. He is a model prisoner. I mean, in Wormwood Scrubs, finally, he doesn't have to live a secret life because everyone knows he's a spy and a communist. So for the first time in his adult life, he can just be himself. He's not living underground. And it, he, he becomes an incredibly likable guy. And of course, he's one of the few educated people in the prison. So he has classes where he teaches these Cockney prisoners German and Arabic and French. He reads the Quran on a, you know, a book stand made for him by a grateful fellow prisoner. He writes letters to the authorities on behalf of his fellow prisoners who can't write. He's just a great guy. Everyone in the prison loves him. The screws, the wardens love him too. You know, he's, he's just a good bloke and he doesn't complain about being there for 42 years. And um, so, yeah, he becomes the kind of most popular man in the prison. But meanwhile, all the while, he's plotting his escape, which isn't very difficult. Escaping from a British prison in the 1960s seems to have been a, you know, bit of a cinch. Mm. And how does that happen? He identifies this Irishman who's about to be released, Sean Burke. So Burke's going to be on the outside. Burke is quite clever. And Burke hates Britain. So uh, Burke agrees to help him escape. They get money from former peace activists who've also been in jail with them. And um, it's really quite amateurish. A burglar breaks a window so that Blake can make it to the outside wall of the scrubs. Burke throws a, roof, a rope ladder up, to, up on top of the wall, forgets to tie it. There's nothing to tie it with. So then Blake has to jump off the wall. It's about a four meter, five meter jump off the wall of Run Wormwood Scrubs. So he's quite badly hurt, breaks his wrist. But anyway, Burke shoves him in a car. And uh, a few minutes later, they're hiding in a bedsit a couple of hundred metres away on High Lever Road in Shepherd's Bush. And it really, really was that simple, wasn't it? I mean, you would have thought that a prisoner like Blake, you know, somebody who is a traitor, possibly one of Britain's most, how can, heinous traitors, wouldn't, why didn't they put him under armed guard, all the rest of it? I think partly because he put them off, off guard by being such a nice bloke. And partly because, I mean, British prisoners escaped. That's what they did. The great train robbers, two of them escaped. Mm -hmm. I mean, remember Ronnie Biggs ending up in Brazil uh, also at about that time. At one point, uh, about just after Blake escaped, 10 prisoners escaped from Wormwood Scrubs in a month, including this bloke known as Frankie the Mad Axeman, who began <laughs> writing letters to the newspapers. So, <laughs> Frankie the <laughs> Mad Axeman. <laughs> Mate, if you're going to go into crime, you need a nickname. You need a good name. You need a it's name. It's all about the good name, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, there was also Mad Frankie Fraser. I mean, they, there's lots of Mad Frankies. So anyway, he escaped. How did he actually get to the USSR, considering he's got the police and MI6 on his tail now? Well, and Burke, who he's hiding with, Burke is actually a, a writer, an artist. He's also a you know small-time crook. But Burke thinks, right, this escape of George Blake, I'm going to write the book of my life about it, which he does, The Springing of George Blake. It's a great book. And so Burke needs it to be known by the police that he did it. So Burke starts writing letters to the police, Burke starts calling the police, tells them where they can find the getaway car. So it's becoming a real problem. Meanwhile, Burke and Blake are hiding in a Hampstead flat with Pat Pottle, who is a peace activist, an anti-bomb activist who'd been jailed for uh, trespassing on an American airbase. 
And uh, so he was helping Blake. And so he's hiding in Hampstead. How are we going to get him out? So they build a camper van. In a camper van, they build a secret compartment. And a peace activist named Michael Randall takes his wife and two young sons on holiday to Germany at Christmas 1966. And Blake is hidden in the secret compartments at the bottom of the camper van. They leave Britain. They go from Dover to Calais. Nobody checks them. It's plain sailing. And Blake is in West Berlin. He walks to an East Berlin border post and demands to speak to uh, somebody from the Soviet command. Mm. It's it's easy. So so the Soviets weren't actually the ones that broke him out. They didn't help him get to Berlin. It was just through connections and friends, etc. And and, uh, how was he treated when when he he gets to, to that checkpoint? The German guard... He's not very forthcoming, but eventually Blake is given a bed while phone calls are made. And luckily, Blake's former KGB handler, Sergei Kondrashev, is in Berlin. Mm. And they find Kondrashev and they say, there's this bloke here. He might be Blake. Kondrashev rushes to the border post and he and Blake embrace and become firm friends for the next 40 years of their lives in Moscow, where Blake is swiftly taken to. And And Blake attends Kondrashev's funeral. And so, yeah, he he um, he gets lucky. So he gets to this place. He gets to the USSR, which is in many ways the embodiment of his dream. Every, you know, he he's a firm and avowed communist. Does it live up to his expectations? Within a week, he knew that communism had failed. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't take long, does it? <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine being that guy? You spent your life, you betrayed hundreds of people for this ideal and you get there and it's fucking shit. <laughs> they all had that experience. Guy Burgess said that um, the Soviet Union was like Glasgow on a Saturday night in the 19th century. <laughs> which I think is the best description I've read. Yeah, And... Um, yeah, so it's very ramshackle, it's run down. Blake is given a nice flat because, you know, he's KGB. But he he has this plan. He wants to drive through the Soviet Union and admire its different regions. And then he discovers the state of Soviet roads, et cetera, et cetera. So he's very downcast. And, of course, the Soviets think that he's a triple agent, that he, he's already been turned by the British. So they're right. not going to give him any responsible work. And so, yeah, it's very miserable. But then, thankfully, the best thing happens to him. His mother, his Dutch mother comes to live with him in Moscow, and that cheers him up immensely. Then he meets a Russian woman, Ida, who he marries. So the thing about Blake, the difference between him and Philby is Philby was a Brit. Philby in Moscow, you know, yearned for Brits, and he'd read the Times, he'd do the Times crossword, he'd listen to the cricket. He has this great description of listening to Arsenal win the FA Cup final in 1971. He lived emotionally in Britain. But Blake was cosmopolitan. He spoke very good Russian, and his view was, I'm just going to make this work, and he did. He he integrates it. He becomes Russian, which McLean does as well, really. And do you think he ever regretted it? He, In terms of once he got there, he realised that communism wasn't going to work. He realised he was fighting on the wrong side. Or did he believe in what he did? He didn't believe in what he did anymore. I mean, he believed that communism was a beautiful ideal. And for him, that mattered. So he could see that the reality was awful. But he thought, well, it's a great ideal, so, you know, it's not such a bad thing that I've given my life to it. But also, because he was a determinist, because he thought everything was predetermined, there is some kind of force, maybe not God, but some force that makes us do what we do. There's no point, he thought, having regrets or um, thinking things might have been different. They couldn't have been different. So he just copes with life as it's thrown at him. And, you know, he'd been everywhere and he'd always coped. He'd been in Cairo. He'd been in a Korean prison. He'd been in uh, post-war Germany. He'd he'd always managed to find his feet. And in that way, that's very admirable. Absolutely. And then, of course, the fall of communism. What was Blake's opinions of that? It sounds as if he thought it was an an inevitability. Yeah, he did. I mean, he thought, you know, given that communism delivered a terrible life to people, it was not going to survive. And yeah, it was quite traumatic because he, you know, he'd seen the British Empire collapse and then the Soviet Empire, and he'd left his his, his homeland, the Netherlands. So he'd lost kind of three homelands, as it were. Um, but he, you know, he he believed in communism with a human face, that kind of fantasy that from Dubček into the eighties, and he thought Gorbachev was that, and he was quite excited about Gorbachev and Yeltsin initially. But yeah, when the Soviet Union collapses, I mean, he. 
he copes. He's coped with everything. By this point, he's he's what? He's over 70 and he he just plugs on. That's really interesting. And Simon, uh, I, we wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the sort of lessons and implications. But uh, the first thing I wanted to ask you is he was obviously and not an ordinary person just by virtue of his life and biography. Was there anything in particular that struck you about him when you met him, when you talked to him? What struck me, he could listen. It's a very rare gift. I mean, as a, I know I'm banging on now, but it's something you learn as a journalist. You learn to listen to people because often the thing that you want to hear is not the thing that they're trying to tell you. They're trying to tell you something more interesting. Journalists can listen, diplomats, psychologists, and spies. And he writes about this somewhere, that if you just listen, the other person will happily tell you everything. And so that made him very likable. Um, I also recognized in him the cosmopolitanism that I have. And so when people call Blake a traitor, which I do as well in the title of my book, I mean, he was a traitor to Britain, but he didn't feel like a traitor because he felt like he was a man of the world, not a man of Britain. And it didn't mean he hated Britain. It's just that he he felt himself to be largely above nation. So, And that kind of adaptability, uh, which I think we cosmopolitans have, I mean, you probably recognize it yourself as well, Constantine, that when you come into a new environment, you're trying to sniff out the codes, the rules. So, you know, I live in Paris and you learn that in Paris, when you greet people, you don't smile. Whereas in the US, when you greet people, you do smile. So these little things. So I recognized a lot of the kind of cosmopolitan tics that he had. And yeah, in a sense, a lot of the spy literature in Britain is about British gentlemen, you know, from James Bond to Philby. And this is a book about a, a cosmopolitan spy. And the the thing that I found very, very interesting is because how everybody seems to keep falling in love with the myth of communism. And it's only when they're confronted by the realities of it does it seem to be this moment where they realise it doesn't work. Why is it we keep falling for the myth? I think in the case of Blake, it's because he had grown up with the religious idea of paradise, it was very important to him that there should be a paradise. And clearly one's own society is never paradise. So paradise must be somewhere else. And then communism gives a, a very convincing picture in a way of paradise, you know, communist literature, Marx. And so he needed paradise, which I don't feel the need of. I mean, I always think as a liberal, I think what we should strive for is the least bad society. But in these kind of, um, I think probably in, all, in most religions, certainly in Islam and Christianity, less so in Judaism, Judaism is not big on paradise, but Islam and Christianity are very big on them. That is this central idea that life on earth is horrible and, you know, these books are written at times when people die young and everyone around you dies and um, it's dreadful, but there is paradise. And so I think communism, the need for communism is the need for paradise. That's a really interesting point. And do you think that is part of, of the distinction there? Because you talk about the least bad society, which is a view, vision I share as well. Uh, accepting the reality that a perfect society is not going to be possible. It's not very inspiring, though, is it? It doesn't, doesn't sell, right? It doesn't sell very well. Where's the, where's the idea, as you say, of paradise or utopia or whatever word you want to use to describe it? Uh, that sells very well. That, that's, that's exciting. That's invigorating. It's convincing. It's persuasive. Uh, it's something that you want to sign up to. You saw that now that we're talking about modernity in the Brexit referendum where the Brexiteers are promising a kind of paradise, a return to the best of Britain, the, the golden age. And Remainers are offering the least bad option. You know, mm. nobody would pretend that life in Britain in 2016 was paradise, but Remainers say, you know, this is about as good as we can make it. And you're right, it's not a very, it's not a great sell. I mean, it is to me, and I think it is to me partly because, you know, my family's from South Africa. So I've seen a society that is totally dysfunctional, that is just awful. And I would go from the Netherlands as a child in the 70s and 80s to visit South Africa and come back to the Netherlands and think, you know, Netherlands is not paradise, but it's pretty damn good. Um, mm. This is about, the, and it was, it was about, the, and it still is today, it's about the least bad society on earth. So I've seen a, a, a society that's really not bad. And I've seen a terrible, dysfunctional, evil society. So I know which one I would choose. 
And we've just we've seen a resurgence in especially the young people very much advocating communism, believing in communism, saying, you know, the classic thing, communism has never been tried. Why is it that this is so popular amongst that generation? I don't know. I don't hear that. I I see that young Americans are talking about socialism, but I think that by that they mean Denmark. They mean universal health care and free college. I don't think they mean nationalization of all production and rule by a Politburo and gulags. I, I mean, Francis, I'd forgotten, of course, that you also have an international background from Venezuela. Yeah. I don't sound it, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like you're very much against any sort of diversity, really. Yeah. And I think that one of the difficult, I mean, the difficulty with the word socialism is it conflates, let's say, Denmark with Venezuela. Yeah. And so it's used by the American right. Well, if you want socialism, you want Venezuela. I, I don't... I don't see among, and also don't see politically movements succeeding that are saying, um, let's let's have communism, let's have the USSR. No, no, there aren't. I, although th- th- there certainly are p- people who are uh, advocating for communism. I agree with you, they're probably a fringe. I mean, the counter argument to that might be that, uh, you know, when the Soviet Union was created, nobody was saying anything about uh, the purges and the gulags and the Politburo or anything like that either. It was all about fairness, equality, justice for workers and uh, and uh, peasants at the at the time. Uh, but it's an, I, I guess a more interesting question might be rather than getting into the nuances of politics, um, the the sort of what happens when people pursue very idealistic visions of of, of the world as opposed to dealing with. With reality, I wonder whether you know your conversations with George Blake and research for the book gave you any insight into the sort of maybe preconditions that encourage people to think in those ways. I mean, Blake himself said uh, there is no idealism anymore. You know, he complains about that at one point. He says, "Well, you know, in my day, people spied out of idealism, but now people only spy out of base motives. You have to pay them money." And I mean, for not for 70 years, but for several decades, there was this political paradise on offer, this Mm. rhetorical paradise from before the Russian Revolution. But let's say until the 60s, 70s, there are quite a lot of people who are falling for it. By the time I was a teenager in the 80s, I don't really think anyone was anymore. Mm. So it it had run its course. And I sometimes wonder if I had been a teenager in the 30s, you know, as my grandmother did, would I have become a communist? She she did. She said she stopped with the Nazi-Soviet pact. I don't know. But um, uh, maybe. I mean, it was a paradise on offer in the 30s at a time when the capitalist powers were refusing to do anything about fascism. So that might be a moment. I mean, Blake became a communist in 1950, by which time we really did know about Stalin's purges, if you care to pay attention. So that by then, it, it, by then, by 1950, communism is going out of fashion, but at the same time, communism is conquering. It's conquered Eastern Europe, it's conquering China. So it's kind of winning, having already gone out of fashion. So I think uh, me and you guys are younger. We've grown up in a time when there hasn't really been a paradise on offer. And in a sense, I think that's been lucky for us because it saved us from diving into mil- millenarian movements. I mean, Trump is offering a version of that, Brexit, but those seem to appeal mostly to old people. Mm, Mm. That's really interesting. And Simon, what lessons do you think can be learned from the life of George Blake? Don't be an idealist. Don't, (laughs) Don't fall for some dream of some country that you don't know about and some system that has never been successfully done. Just go with what works. Uh, Don't, I mean... My favorite election slogan was um, Konrad Adenauer, the German chancellor in the 50s, at one point campaigns under the slogan, Keine Experimente, no experiments, which <laughs> I I have to say, I um, as, a, as an anti-idealist, I share. Yeah, oh, it's interesting. Oh, I, I feel like you're very much in your place in terms of being in Paris and not smiling when you greet mm-hmm. people. You have that sort of <laughs> very reserved demeanor. But uh, listen, Simon, it's been great chatting to you. The book not only is a very interesting story, but it's incredibly well written. Uh, and, you know, your experience and your writing skills really shine through. So uh, it's out on the 4th of February. Is that 4th? Yeah. Yeah, for February. Happy Traitor. Happy Traitor. And we really recommend everybody reads it. Uh, but before 
uh, we let you go, we've got one final question for you. Which is always, what's the one thing we're not talking about, but we really should be? Modern spying, hacking. I mean, in Blake's day, it was very hard to get any information on what the other side was doing. And now, I mean, the Russians probably know more about the US government than most people in the Trump cabinet. Hmm. Hmm. Simon, thank you so much. Um, if people want to find you online, where's the best way to be uh, to do that? Uh, look for me on Twitter. It's Cooper Simon is my Twitter handle, and I'll be tweeting about the Happy Traitor obsessively promoting this book um, to death. It's worth promoting, but hopefully not to your own death, at least. <laughs> uh, but Simon, thanks so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate your time. We recommend everybody gets the Happy Traitor, and we will, of course, see you very soon with another brilliant interview like this one or a live stream. All of them go out at 7 p.m. UK time. Take care and see you soon, guys. We hope you've enjoyed this incredible interview. Remember to subscribe and hit the bell button so that you never miss another fantastic episode. And if you believe that the work we do here at Trigonometry is important, support us by joining our Locals community using the link below.